Way back in 1996, Naughty Dog created Crash Bandicoot, a kind of unofficial Sony PlayStation mascot. In the 21 years since that original game, there's only been a handful of sequels to come out of the franchise, and Crash Bandicoot has been handed from company to company as those games were made. This inevitably would mean numerous character design changes, and Crash Bandicoot has changed quite a bit since 1996. But exactly how much has Crash changed? There's only one way to find out. Welcome to Low Poly. So here we have the original Crash Bandicoot model, and this was actually modeled by Jason Rubin, who was the co-creator of Crash Bandicoot. I actually reached out to Jason for a bit more information on this model. He told me that the original Crash model was 532 mostly flat shaded polygons, and it took them about six months to get that perfect mix. As you can see, the only textures on the Crash model are on his back and on the shoes. This was both an artistic and a technical decision. Since polygons on 3D characters at smaller resolutions were just a few pixels, shaded characters actually looked better than textured ones. Using a 512 by 240 video mode, they discovered that the PlayStation was actually really good at rendering shaded but untextured triangles. And it would do this just as well as if it was running in the 320 by 240 resolution. Because of this decision, they ended up going with more polys on the characters than textures. Now, one of the most interesting things about this model is just what they were able to do with it with animation. You'll notice that unlike other models we've seen from 1996 on this show that this model is one whole mesh. There are no breaks in his arms or legs, but you can actually see up his shorts. The way that Crash was animated is instead of using a live bone structure with one joint waiting, they instead went with something called vertex animation. This involved grabbing the vertices or different points of Crash's model and moving them around to generate the desired pose. They would then store the location of every vertex every frame at 30 frames per second. This system did away with having to have separate models for every part of the body, but it also brought new challenges. To get all of this working, they had to invent some assembly language vertex compressors. The result was that Crash was better animated and more emotive than most 3D characters of the time. Crash's model looks relatively simple to look at, but it's amazing to see what they achieved with animation just by using techniques which nobody else was using. I also wondered if any changes occurred in Crash's model between 1, 2, and 3. Jason told me he didn't remember changing his model, but he can't imagine he wouldn't have improved something. So it's safe to say there were some changes, but this is the base model for three games. Before we move on from the first Crash Bandicoot game, let's take a look at this jumbled mess of polygons. Whenever Crash would spin, this is basically the model they would swap out for the regular model. If you slow down gameplay footage, you can see how this change occurs, but I'd never really thought of it as being two separate models, but it really makes sense. Mostly this model is separate parts all jumbled together to make it look like Crash is spinning, and the rest of it is dealt with alpha tech. Textures. This model was difficult to get hold of and didn't come with any textures, so I had to take a bit of artistic license, but this is somewhat what it would look like. However, the geometry of the model is absolutely what appeared in the game. Pretty crazy stuff. Okay, moving on to 2001 now, and Crash Bandicoot went from being made by Naughty Dog to being made by Traveler's Tales or Euricom for the GameCube version of Crash Bandicoot Wrath of Cortex. Now this model sits at 2,200 tries, so a significant leap in poly count compared to the original Crash Bandicoot games. Overall, the design stayed fairly faithful to the originals, but added small details with textures. Like, if we look at the label on Crash's jeans, it actually says Crash. Instead of the mitts for hands that he had in the first games, Crash now actually has fingers. If we take a look at the wireframe, we can see that Crash's eyebrows this time round are simply just an alpha texture applied to a flat plane. We can also take a look at the inside of Crash's mouth, which is fun, I guess. Now, I wouldn't have imagined animating this model to be anything as complex as the original games. I really like the hair in the ear, it's a nice touch. They could have used an alpha texture, but they chose to model it instead. Naturally, the higher poly count results in a rounder, smoother model. But knowing what I know about the original PS1 model, this just doesn't seem as impressive somehow. But I have to give props to Traveler's Tales for sticking as close as they could to the original character design. 
design. As we're gonna go through this episode, we'll see that a lot of different companies took artistic license, whether you like it or not. In 2004, Traveler's Tales developed yet another Crash Bandicoot game, this time called Crash Twin Sanity. The Crash model for this game sits at 2,676 tries, so roughly 500 more tries than the Wrath of Cortex model. Now, Crash's design is still in keeping with the original concept, but there's a few extra bits of flavor here and there. He's still got that crazy look in his eyes, but the gloves are slightly different, and he's got these metal knee pads, and he's now wearing Converse. We won't talk about the crotch double fly zip thing going on, we'll just breeze right over that one. I gotta say, I love the modeling on this one. It's so simple, and the texture work helps emphasize, like, the design of Crash's shoes, and Crash's enormous white teeth. Crash's eyebrows this time are a 3D model, and not just a texture like in the previous game. Overall, it's a very simple model in design, and it's still in keeping with the original tone of the games. There's not too much else to say about this model, so let's move on to 2005 in Crash Tag Team Racing. And this time, Crash has been passed on to yet another developer, Radical Entertainment. This model takes a significant drop in poly count at 1,546 tries. It's a much simpler model, and there are certain things that give this away, like the chunky hands with the very angular fingers. The design of Crash is going back to the original games, and you can see this with the red sneakers. They're the same shade of red, but they've elaborated on the design of the laces. Of course, if we look at the wireframe, we can see that that's all just texture work and there's no real details being modeled. If we take a close look at Crash's eyes, we can see the iris is just a separate model on the eyeball. They then put a texture on that model to make it look like an eyeball, and I assume this was easier to animate. A close look at the hands reveals just how blocky they are. But when we consider that the original Crash had mitts for hands, this kind of keeps in tone with the original character design. Crash is a very cartoony, stylized kind of character, so it fits quite well. The Crash model used in Tag Team Racing would prove to be the last that followed the original design quite closely. After that, everything changed. In 2007, we'd see Crash of the Titans, and Crash would be completely redesigned. The development team over at Radical Entertainment chose to throw out the original design choices and went for a more cutesy looking Crash. Body-wise, not much in the design changed, but they did choose to get rid of the fingerless gloves, and gave him this tribal tattoo which, while nicely textured, I'll give it that, was probably not the best choice in my opinion. Come to think of it, is it a tattoo, or is it just miraculously well-designed fur? Like, black fur in just the right places. While the character design this time round isn't in keeping with what we're used to with Crash, this is actually a really nice model. Crash actually looks like he has fur now, and it's not just assumed with big blocks of color indicating where fur should be. Polygon count this time around sits at 2,620 tries, so it's slightly lower poly than 2004's Twin Sanity. I love the texture work on the converse and the shorts. It's really detailed, but still simple in keeping with the cartoony look. Taking a look at the wireframe for the whole body model is actually really simple, but it's amazing just how much that blend of texture and model really breathes life into the character. The clumps of fur that sit on Crash's head and go down his back are actually just big triangles, but again, if they're well textured, it looks like fur. Though it might not be to everyone's tastes and might not feel like Crash, this is actually a really nice model. I like it. Then, a year later in 2008, we got Crash Mind Over Mutant, and Radical Entertainment further refined the design of Crash. Well, I say refined, but what I really mean is they just made his shorts shorter. They also bumped the polygon count up to 3,466 tries, so so far this is the largest poly crash we have. If we take a look at the wireframe, we can see that Crash's hair clumps at the back, which were previously modeled, are now just alpha textures put on planes. I'm not entirely sure why this decision was made, I think the modeled version was kind of better, maybe? I don't know. They also modeled some details like the loopholes around the shorts, and also the belt buckle. You can also see up Crash's shorts again. Thinking about it, a design choice to make his shorts, well, shorter, may possibly have been so they can get better bends out of the knees and the legs, although probably it was just an artistic choice. But that's it, after 2008 there were no other Crash games made. Well, until 2017 where we get to see remastered versions of the original three classics. And how many polygons will this Crash model have? I guess we'll have to wait and find out.
Thanks for watching this episode of Low Poly with Crash Bandicoot. If you're loving the show so far, please go and check out the Super Mario episode and the Sonic episode already up on the channel. Don't forget you can follow me on Twitter or on Instagram where I usually post little sneak peeks of things I'm working on. It's a great way for you guys to keep up to date with the channel and everything that's happening with this show. And as always, a huge thanks to everybody who supports the Patreon. You guys are the ones that make it all possible.